It's my great pleasure to introduce Cashman. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. I love having this full room. I mean, that's really great. Um, my lecture today is about uh, improving the, di the dynamics in the pet bird home. So I'll be covering really quite a large area. When I started writing the proceedings paper for this, it was like 27 pages. And I said, nobody wants to read 27 pages. And I edited it down to 17. Then I edited it down to, I think, 14. And I think I finally got it down to like six. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the one bird person, or one person bird, and uh, birds that fight with each other, other pets. And that's very general about the other pets. And we're also going to be talking about punishment. So. Um, I've got a lot of area to cover, and we've got a little uh, activity that we're going to do that I know one of you has already participated in one time. And so that's going to take some time. So I'm going to ask you to hold questions, write them down. And if we have time at the end, I'll answer questions. And then uh, if I don't get to your questions, you can always talk to me out there. So this is a, a Wat in Tha uh, Thailand, and I think it's the sort of serene, peaceful family home that we would love to have with our birds, but that's seldom the case. That's it. This one. So I want to say, first of all, that this is my definition for pet. I know a lot of people don't like the word pet, and I use it all the time. And this is the reason that I use it, is because I consider it a family member. It's like brother, sister, mother, father to me. Oh, whoops. I think I went too far. There we go. Our, our birds are different from us. Uh, they have two feet. So when people come up to say, oh, you're, you're a family member with the four feet, you go, no. My family members all have two feet. They don't have any arms. And, you know, they don't have any hands. And they have feathers. And we tend to, to uh, anthropomorphize birds. But they do have the feathers. We don't. <laughs> We may try, but we don't. <laughs> Parrots, they're, they're beautiful, they're intelligent, they're fun, they're messy, they're loud. They do bite us, they, they demand our attention, and they can take over our entire lives. But they have a tendency to mirror us. We look at birds and we actually see some of ourself in them. And because we see ourselves in them, we tend to anthropomorphize. And it's really easy to, to anthropomorphize parrots, I think, over other animals because they are so extremely intelligent. And we see that intelligence, we, we recognize it, and it, it can be a good thing to anthropomorphize. <laughs> or it can be a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good if it makes us more committed to our birds, if we take more responsibility, if we think that they are as intelligent and as important as we are, and we take that into consideration, then the anthropomorphism is good. It's bad when we apply labels to them and when we have unrealistic expectations of them. Because they're not little humans in feathered clothing. As much as we sometimes may want them to be, they're not. And I love this saying by Einstein, who, as they say, is too sexy for his sweater. And that is, you know, you have to judge a fish by being a fish. If he's got to climb a tree, then he's always going to think he's stupid when he may actually be a genius. Now, the other extreme is to be anthropocentric. And we shouldn't want to, we shouldn't do this either. Because animals do have feelings. We may not be able to know what those feelings are because they're, they're not overt, they're convert. And so we should, but we should still recognize that they do have feelings there. Their feelings are probably very much like ours. It's just that we can't really pinpoint them. We can't really know exactly what the bird is feeling at that time. All we can do is read their body language. Okay, so now we have the one-person bird. Um, 
very often the birds tend to gravitate to one person in the family. And when this happens, it can make the other people in the family, especially if it's just a couple living together, uh, it can make them feel like the odd man out. Usually there's one person that the bird really tends to drive away more than the others. And it, it's a very lonely feeling. And if this is part of your, your family dynamics at this time, then you have to recognize the fact that the other person really does feel bad. And it, it's expected. It's normal. It's natural for us to feel bad if we're the odd man out. And when that happens, we can become extremely resentful. It can make us angry and make us feel like we're a failure. And so we tend to lash out. But the thing to remember about the one-person bird is that birds are flock animals. They, they, don't, they don't just live in a pair. They may bond, but they are flock animals. And when they bond, they still go and, and meet their family members that have grown up, go play with their friends, see mom and dad again. They interact with their family and their friends and their entire flock. So that means that they have to have social skills. Now, we are their adopted family. We are their adopted flock. And so they should show us the same respect that they show for a flock of birds. In breeding season, you know, the, the birds may gravitate towards one person, and that's normal, but that should not last all year. That's not a year-round activity. You should not, well, if you're human, I guess you might want to have sex year-round, but your bird should not. <laughs> birds do not need to do that. One of the problems that we have is that we set up a breeding season that lasts the entire year. We provide the birds with a situation where, you know, food is abundant year-round. The photo period never changes. Uh, there's no rainy season. Uh, so the birds are, are going, it's time to breed. It's time to breed. We're supposed to be having babies. Why aren't we having babies? So take a hint from nature. One of the things that birds do in the wild that keep families close together is they go places together. You always think, take your bird out. Don't take them, just take them out of the cage. Take them out of the house. Go places with your birds. So take them out of the house. Go to some place that's bird friendly, you know, family member, friends, bird friendly place. You can even go to parks and things. Other things that you can do is you can. Uh, control your antecedents, and you can create a pleasurable relationship between the odd man out, or the entire family, and your bird. And you can do this by giving each family member a responsibility. So the entire family, from the smallest child to the, to the most responsible adult, should have a duty that is connected to the bird. Little children can do things like it is their job every day to bring you the water bowl or bring you the food bowl. Even if it's maybe just that uh, you take the food bowl out of the cage and the child carries it to the sink so that you can wash it. But it should be some duty. And the thing is not to force this on any child. Because if you make the child do it, you are no longer creating a pleasurable relationship. The relationship has to be pleasurable with both the bird and the person. They both have to enjoy this. So let them choose what it is they want to do. Let them say, I want to do this with the bird every day. I think I can do this. And when they do it, make sure that you reinforce it. We're stuck. We seem to be stuck. That's back. Next one. <laughs> there we go. And the favorite person should not feed the birds their meal. It's already like you. You don't need to give them food. If it gets to where he doesn't like you anymore, you can start giving them food. Well, there we go. The least favorite person should be the only person to give the birds its favorite treat. 
so it starts to associate the least favorite preferred person with its favorite food. Target and station train your birds. This is one of the most important things that you can do with your pets. Target train them to a certain spot and teach them to stay there. Train your bird to do at least three to five tricks. Last night I was talking about the IAAC uh, BC meeting. And normally the tricks that I recommend is touch the beak to like a target stick, touch right foot to a target stick, touch left foot to a target stick, lift the wing and go around in a circle. And the reason that I recommend these tricks is because they can be useful as you kind of expand on them so that you can use them in other areas. Target train to uh, this, the beak to this, the target stick. You can use that to give them medicine later on. Target train to the feet. If you ever have to put medication on the feet, you can do that easily. Uh, or clip nails. You can expand and make it nail clipping. Tar uh, get the wings, lift the wings up. You can look under the wings to examine your bird. Go around the circle. You can examine your bird all the way around his body. And you can start doing that with the tricks. Fill your environment full of positive reinforcers. Good, fun things to do. So that the bird has this really enjoyable environment that it's going to associate with the entire family. Make certain your bird gets plenty of exercise. This is one of the things. A lot of behavioral problems disappear when the bird gets enough exercise and has enough enrichment in their life. Those two things alone can make a world of difference in how your bird behaves. And make sure your bird gets the right amount of sleep and rest. Provide foraging opportunities. That's one of the, the areas of enrichment that you can really expand on. OK, the matching law. Uh, I, I know the consultants will know this, but how many of you here know what the matching law is? OK. No back there? What the matching law is. OK, what the matching law is is basically if he and I had a bird together, and that bird would step on, on my arm, and I reinforce stepping up 90% of the time, and he reinforces it 60% of the time. Then when I ask the bird to step up on my arm, that bird will step up onto my arm 90% of the time. And when he asks the bird to step up on his arm, the bird will step up on his arm 60% of the time. So the rate of behavior that, that you're asking for and reinforcement is equal. It is matched. And that is a law of behavior that is not something that someone made up, this has been tested. So your rate of, of compliance to what you've asked for and reinforcement is equal. OK, my birds don't get along. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sometimes we have a little problem with them, though. No. OK. So we create a, uh, a pleasurable association, just like we did with humans. But it's a little bit harder with a bird. Train each bird separately to do at least three tricks, three to five tricks, but at least three tricks, and have them do them inside their cage at first. Take the cages and put them as close together as you can, and watch the bird's body language. And as long as the body language remains calm, you, that's the distance that you can keep the birds. As soon as you see the birds start to stress out, tense up, push the cages further apart until the birds are calm. And then, going back and forth between the birds, you can do two things depending upon what your birds behave like. Uh, what I prefer is to actually start having them do tricks. These are my two birds that don't get along. And so, what you would do is you go up to bird one and say, Quinton, wave. And Quinton waves. And Quinton gets a treat. And you get a treat too. And now I hope, wave. You wave. 
And you get the treat. Get the treat. You don't have to wave. You can just sit there. Um, you know, go around in a circle. You go around the circle. <laughs> treat. Treat. Every time one of the birds does something, the other one also gets a treat. They both get a treat at, for, for having the other bird do something. He makes her get a treat. She makes him get a treat. And then, after about, see? At, oh yes, and you make those treats very tiny so that you can work with them as long as possible. But um, I usually recommend that you don't work over three minutes. Three minutes is my maximum. Then you separate them. So he's on that side of the room. She's on this side of the room. I go over and I work with him for three minutes. She gets nothing. She gets ignored. <laughs> she can do all the tricks she wants. and She's, she's going to get ignored. But he's going to get there. So they're far apart now. Then I go over to her. And I work with her for three minutes. And I make her do the tricks. And she gets all these treats for getting, doing the tricks. He gets nothing. He gets nothing when he's far away from her. Then you put the cages back close together again, and he gets the treat, she gets the treat. She gets the treat, he gets the treat. So when they're close together, they both get treats. And they make the other bird receive the treat. But when they're far apart, only one of them gets the treat. Yes. And then you slowly start to move the cages closer and closer together. Do we have that yet? Here we go. Steps three and four. Okay, so you slowly start to move the cages closer and closer together. And um, as long as they remain calm, you can push the cages together. Okay. Now, when the cages are almost touching, step back. Don't start your training session right away, but there's the cages are nearly touching. Step back and look at your birds. What are they doing? Are they as close together as they can get in their cages? This one's right here, this one's right there. Or do they choose to move to the opposite sides of the cage? If they choose to stay close together, then that means you can start working on the next step. If they choose to be at the opposite ends of the cage, then you have to work with them some more. OK. You can start working with them on gems outside, but first you work with just one bird. And what you do with that bird is if they're flighted, you put the bird on a gem, and you target the bird to like a corner of the room. Um, if they're not uh, flighted, then you tar target the bird to, a, to the opposite side of the gym. But you make sure that target training is very, very fluent. You can start with a targeting stick because that's the easiest way to do it. And then target the locations. And that's Jackson over there targeting to a target stick. So now you have both birds targeted to their respective corners. One bird would be targeted over here, one bird would be targeted over there. And you got that. And then uh, when the behavior is fluent, and by fluent we mean it's quick, it's trustworthy, you don't have to worry about whether or not the bird is going to listen to you. They know that behavior extremely well. Then you can put them on their gyms outside, and you do the same thing you did with the cages. Put the gyms far apart, see if the birds are comfortable on the gym, keep moving the gyms closer together, until you see that that comfort level has dropped, then push the gyms further apart. You do the same thing you did in the cage. And you do this until you can actually have the gyms right next to each other, and the birds can interact with each other. And if they begin to fight, you target to, to their corners, just like the boxers. Right. You should just be able to stand right in front of the cages. So it doesn't really matter if the back's against the wall or not. The birds have to come to you to the front of the cage where you're working. 
Okay, birds and other pets. And, you know, I love this because we love to see our, our pets interact with each other, especially when they're not of the same species. And we tend to get overconfident. Um, most, almost all of the deaths and injuries that I have heard of with birds and other pets have been with dogs. People are vigilant around their cats. They expect the cats to try and do something to the birds. They don't expect the dog to. And so I see more accidents that happen with dogs than with cats. So no matter how well your, your pets get along, always, always keep an eye on them. There was um, one case that I knew of where this uh, couple had this African gray and, and their dog for years, and they were buddies, and everything was fine. And one day they walk into the kitchen, and there's the bird laying dead next to the dog food bowl. And apparently the dog, the bird tried to eat out of the dog food bowl. I don't think the dog meant to hurt the bird, but it did. So never leave them unsupervised. And like I said, you know, take your birds out, go places with your birds, but keep an eye out for other people's pets. Not just your own, you have to watch out for it. Other people's pets as well. Um, you know, dogs see a bird in a park. They may try to jump on you and get your bird. Um, children will run up to you and want to touch your bird. Uh, all sorts of things can spook your birds. In some cases, there are adults that are just plain mean and will try to do something to hurt your bird. So just keep your eyes out. OK, I always talk, talk about positive reinforcement. And I want people to use as much positive reinforcement, as little negative reinforcement or positive punishment as possible. But that does not mean that I want your birds to run amok. So you have to take control of the situation. So how do you do that? One of the best ways is to carefully arrange antecedents. The most difficult behaviors, careful antecedent arrangements really make a difference. And I'll give you two examples of this. One is one that I did with birds, and the other one was one that shocked the heck out of me. But it, it was wonderful. Um, a friend of mine has a hyacinth macaw, and I wonder where he got it, um, <laughs> that loves to get into bags. Somebody brings the bag in. He has his favorite types of bags. And by bags, I mean any kind of bag, even purses. And he goes and tears them up, <laughs> pulls all the stuff out of them, has this wonderful time going through people's bags. And then there are certain people he just loves to chase. And when these guests come to her, their house, he runs on the floor, runs after them, chases them all over the place, and they run away from him screaming. And then he tears up their bag. <laughs> So he, ha he has the best time. So how do we deal with this behavior? Well, what I had him do is get a little remote control truck you can go around your house with. And I had him get all these different bags and put great birdie stuff into the bag. And the bird was allowed to play with these bags in particular. These were his bags. Give him one of the bags, let him tear it up. And do that long before any of the guests arrive. And then what I had him do is take the bag and put it on the little remote control truck. And then the bird would go after the bag, and he would make the remote control truck move a little way. And he'd have to run after the truck. And then when you get there, at first you just let him tear up the bag so that he's reinforced for chasing the, the truck. But then you started having the truck go further and further and further, and you had him chase the truck all over the house. And he got to chase this truck everywhere. And before the guests would come, he put the bag on the remote control truck, make the bird run all over the whole house. The bird is now tuckered out. He's played with his toys. He's ripped that bag all to pieces. He's got a spare bag ready just in case when the guests arrive. Guests come, and now he's, he's satiated. He's had his fun. OK, so that's one, one that we did with the birds. And then um, one of the members of IAABC is, or actually quite a few of them, are both animal behavioral consultants and psychologists. 
And I had asked about antecedent arrangements and how people had used them to their benefit. And one of the women chose to tell me about a human uh, situation. And so she was uh, working at a home where, or she was asked to consult at a home, where uh, they had uh, several adults with um, mental deficiencies that lived there together. One of the men was capable of working outside of the home. So he worked outside of the home, but when he came back, he was so stressed from all the work that he would go and jump all over the furniture and break things. And he would you know, jump up and down on the furniture. Things would break. The furniture would break. Things around him would break. One of the other people, one of the women, this would upset her. And she'd start rocking back and forth and crying. And she'd just sit there and bawl and cry. And one of the other men there was obese. And as soon as all this happened, and nobody was paying attention to him, he headed for the kitchen and would eat all kinds of food while nobody was looking, mostly junk food, and he'd gain, gain more weight. And then there was a fourth person, a woman, who all of this upset her so much, she'd go over and start beating on the guy that's jumping on the sofa. So, I mean, how do you deal with this, right? What are we going to do? So what? What they did is they got a trampoline, and they put the trampoline in the house. And the guy would come home from work, and he could jump up and down on his trampoline. He wasn't breaking anything. He was just jumping up and down on the trampoline, relieving his own stress. Nobody needed to rock and cry because he wasn't breaking anything. The guy who would run off into the kitchen and stuff his face, they took all of the junk food out. The two women would go into the kitchen with him, and they showed him how to prepare healthy food. You know, I had carrot sticks and celery and stuff like that. And so he started eating healthy food. He lost weight. Everybody's happy. So a creative use of antecedent arrangement can be very, very beneficial. You just have to put your mind to it and think hard about it. Give your bird choices. We don't give our birds enough choices, and we don't even think about the choices that we can give them. One of the things that I do as these two babies, and I put their food into their cages. They actually run around on top of their cages, and I let them do that. They fly all over the room, and uh, I always put one, at least like in the morning when they get their fresh food, they get one macadamia nut in their food bowl, because that's really what they want, but I don't want them gorging my macadamia nuts all day. And then I get little plastic beads, actually big plastic beads for my birds, and I hold four of them, two in each hand. And I go up to one bird, and I hold my hands out, and I'll say things like, do you want the red ball, or the yellow cylinder, or the orange disc, or the blue cube? And I hold them up. And the bird will lean towards one hand or the other. And so I'll put these down. I say, OK, you want the blue cube, or do you want the yellow disc? And they will lean towards one. So they're picking it. They're getting a choice. I put that in their food bowl, and they go running into their cage. Each one gets a choice. Each one gets a choice. There's things like that. You get new toys. You come here to the convention. You buy toys for your birds. You, if your bird's not afraid of them, you can just go up to them and not say, here's your new toy. Hold up two toys. Which one would you like to play with? Let them choose. You put them on their, their play stand. Don't just say, here, you will go here. Instead of that, let them have a choice. And you'll say, do you want to go to the top perch, or do you want to go to the bottom perch? Now, what this does, yeah, whoops, went the wrong way, is it sets a parameter for the bird's choices. It doesn't say, you will go to your play stand. It doesn't say, do you want to go to your play stand? The you will go to your play stand is understood, but you're giving the bird the choice of where to go. Do you want to go up? Do you want to go down? Not do you want to go. So you're setting the parameters for the choices. And that way, you're teaching your bird to make good choices. OK, primary reinforces lose their, their value 
once uh, satiation has occurred. So you want to make sure that you really pair, strongly pair your secondary reinforcers to your primary reinforcers. Because once you get full of macadamia nuts, you don't want any more. And once you're not hungry, it's not going to work. So when you're training your bird to associate a secondary reinforcer like the word good to a primary reinforcer, you just go over with little treats, hand the treats, good, good, good. They're not doing anything but taking the treat from you. Good, good, good. The word good is being associated with that treat and strongly associated with that treat until the point that you don't have to give the treat anymore. You can just say good and that will be enough for your bird. The food does not, is no longer a requirement. But you have to make sure that you condition this very, very strongly. OK, why shouldn't I use force? When you're using force, positive punishment, negative reinforcement, what you create is escape and avoidance behavior. And it, at, at its worst, it will destroy your relationship. It will make it deteriorate to, to nothing. At its best, it's just not going to be as trusting as it could be. It can cause aggression. That's one way to escape the situation is through aggression. It can cause a decrease in response. So you're using force for one behavior. Let's say you're forcing your bird to go into the cage. Well, not only will the bird maybe not want to go into the cage even more, but the bird will not want to do other things that you ask because the bird is slowly becoming apathetic. It can create phobias to all of the things in the environment, including the person who is using the force. And worst of all, the more you use force, the more reinforcing it is for you. Because what happens is that in most cases, you are not punishing the behavior. By punishing, I mean diminishing the future behavior. You are not diminishing that future uh, behavior. All you're doing is interrupting it. And so you go in and you're using some sort of force. Um, for instance, let's say you're forcing the bird to step up onto your arm. And you take your arm and you press it against the bird's chest. The bird won't step up. And you're going, step up, step up, step up. So you're interrupting the I don't want to come to you behavior. And the bird is being forced to step up onto your hand. But 10 years later, you may still be doing the same thing. Because the bird never really learned to step up onto your hand. You have not diminished or increased that behavior of stepping up. You have not diminished the behavior of running away from you. And if you succeed in actually stopping the behavior, it will be replaced by some other behavior. And if it's going to be replaced by another behavior, then you may as well be the one to choose that behavior and not the, the bird. OK. What I want you to do now is we're going to do a little exercise. This is going to take some time, so I'm going to ask for, for you to work real quickly and to remember what I say. Um, I'm going to give you a number, and two of you are going to get the same number. Remember, I, actually, I'm not going to do a number. I'm just going to have you go up, and I'll tell you who we pair off. I want you to go over here, and you're paired with him. Okay. Now I want you to go over here, and you're paired with her. I want you to go over here, and you're paired with her. I want you to go over there, and you are paired with her. Remember who you're paired with. I want you to go over there, and you're paired with her. I want you to go over there, and you're paired with her. You're paired with her. And you over here, everybody on this side is going to go this side. You're paired with her. You're paired with her. And you are paired with her. Okay. And you are paired with her with the glasses. First person with the glasses. <laughs> OK? OK? And you in the orange, you're paired with her. And you with a pretty blouse, you're paired with Tom. 
And you are paired with her. And you are paired with him. Okay. And uh, we already paired you. You are paired with Hello. You're paired with her. Uh huh. And no, this is everybody. This is everybody. Everybody. You with her. And you with her. Okay, the two of you. And red blouse. Her. Okay. You and you. And you. And you. Ah, uh, we will put you with her. I see her over there. <laughs> Didn't see you before. And you with her. Ah, uh, her. Okay. And who do we have left here? Okay. So you two. Okay. So you go on this side and you come on this side. Okay. Pardon? Oh, he has to operate the computer, yes. Okay, so all the birds, you guys over on this side are going to be birds, and you people are trainers. I want all the birds as far back there as you can get. Okay? Yeah, the people on this side. You were supposed to be on this side? Okay. So, okay. All people go on this side, that were on this side, go to that side. Okay, and all the other people, are you, were you on this side or this side? She's on that side? Okay, way over there, way over here. Okay, so, okay. I'm going to have to say this out loud, though I normally do it covertly. So, I normally do this covertly with all the trainers. So, you guys are going to hear it so you'll know what the instructions are. You are to teach your bird a trick. Any trick you like, you pick the trick. The thing is, you are not allowed to use any gesturing. You may not go like this, you may not go like, you may not grab your bird and make your bird move, okay? Your bird is your partner on the other side, and your trick is not a word that you can say. Like, let's say you want to chain your bird to wave. You cannot say wave because they know what wave means. Okay? So you pick a number, any number you like, and that number will represent the trick you're going to teach your bird. Got that? Okay. 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 Right. Now, yes, I know, but they know what that means too. Pardon? No, you pick your own numbers. You can pick your own numbers. You can pick any number you like. Yeah. So, like, I'm going to teach you to do seven. So I go up to you and I say seven. And you have to figure out what seven is. So your bird has to figure out what seven is. So Seven is my command. Yes, you may say good, you may talk to them, you may say good, but you may not say the name of your trick, you may not gesture, you may not pull them or make them move in any physical way. Right. And you may not say no. You may not say no. No, no. No, no. Huh? No, you can't do any gesturing. And you have to figure out how to get them to do what you want without gesturing. <laughs> Well, that's what, that's what you got a bird, you, your bird doesn't. Good. You can say good. You can say good. That's all you can, you can say good. Well, what you have to do is shape the behavior. For instance, yeah, he'll like come forward. What? Seven? Seven? Doing your repertoire of dances? Good. Seven? Good. Seven? Good. Seven? Good. Seven? Good. Seven? Good. 
Okay? Okay, so now it's your turn. Get together with your birds. And you have three minutes. Watch the clock. When you see the clock get to zero, you have to stop. They have to join us. This is what you did when you did it in Japanese. It's right. Yes. You saw what I did. You can't, can't, you can only use the number. Well, I can say it. You can say the number. But you can't say what it is, but you can't verbalize the actual behavior. Okay, I saw it counts down after 30 seconds. Okay. And if it started, it start should have started. Well, I noticed it went too fast. Oh, it did? I I brought it back to it. Oh, no. Not that I did that. They can't see it because they're blocking it. <laughs> have to look at their butt. down to zero, there's a uh, start and end. Yeah. It's a repeat, I think. And uh, we'll be doing, we'll be doing uh, three more trips. And then we'll go on to the next one. I might, I might stop it at, um, I might stop it at two more. while your flock is here. <laughs> and I wanted to make sure that you know how much we appreciate you coming and present you with our gift for the year. Thank you. Is my time up? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, then we're going to stop. Uh, well, my talk, so I'm going to try to rush through the rest and we'll just stop. So, you decide that you have to do something that's more severe. And you try a more severe punishment. Uh, you have to withdraw some time, and then you decide you've got to really hack at this problem, or it's just not going to go away. And so you start hacking at the problem, but it tends to backfire on you. And, oh, now you don't know what in the world you're going to do. But you try again. You're going to rise up to greater heights of punishment. And as you do, things just seem to get out of control. <laughs> and we have perfectly lost control. 
And so you try the most harsh method you can possibly think of. And you think you've gotten rid of that darn problem. And then, whoa, it comes back to haunt you. And I think that the Hydra is a really good example of what happens when you use punishment. You cut off one head, and all that happens is that another one grows back in its place. But if you practice self-discipline, you gain knowledge about behavioral science, this creates harmony, and it unlocks the mystery of having a peaceful home. So, and those are the people who helped me, my Facebook contributing friends and my husband. Thank you so much.